Yo, 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 what's up all you burner stoners and potheads and especially all you gardeners out there. This is Mr. Wee Man and Big Girl with the Grow Hour. Big Girl, my brother, how you doing? What's up? I'm doing good, dude. How are you doing? I'm super stoked. You know why? Why? Tell me why. Besides getting baked with you, we're going to be talking about bugs. Yeah. Bugs, bugs, bugs with our new friend, Eric. Eric Vandersloos, is that how you pronounce it? Yeah, slews, slies. S- slies? I like slies <laughs> better. Say hello, say hello <laughs> to everybody out there, Eric. Hey, guys. Eric, great to have you on the show. We're going to be talking about bugs. But before we get talking about IPM and bugs, let's get baked, Big Earl. And and uh, let's have some fun. I am smoking a cured, a first week cured uh, Ursula Berry BX, which was bred by you, but also helped out by our friend Humminbird Hills. Yeah, and this was- is this is Mrs. Weedman's first grow. My wife's Mrs. Weedman, Eric. So this is her first grow, and she did an outdoor grow. So this is perfect because I have a lot of questions about the bugs we found and some of the some of the uh, uh, buds outside that we had to either pick out. So this is gonna be a great show. But but big girl, tell you what, smells like grass. Smells like pure outdoor grow. But smokes very nice for only being like a few days curing. But dude, the high was like three hours straight up, straight up, straight up oh. high for three yeah. hours and took the back pain away. So amazing. Super stoked that Mrs. Weeman was very, she was very disappointed in the smell. She's like, I'm not smelling anything. I'm like, I can smell it from here. What are you talking about? It smells yeah. great. It smells like fucking grass, pure outdoor grass. Love it. I don't know. I don't know. We smoked half of the joint. She's like, oh, I feel great. See? Yeah. Don't fucking judge the, the weed before you smoke it, you know? So what are you smoking on, my brother? She's used mm-hmm. to the indoor. So oh, yeah, 100%. Rain on it and stuff. And, but, you know. Yeah. Uh, Ken's is what I rolled up today. Ooh, I do like that. Well, Ken Cheese Hayes, I uh, have a few different phenos of it. And uh, I rolled up a nice little blunt, too. I realized I never smoked a blunt on the show before. So I rolled up nice. my blunt, see how it, how it uh, smokes out of the tobacco. And uh, we'll see. We'll see. Talking some bugs. You smoked anything I'm fire super- lately, Eric? Yeah, we've been smoking on Eric. Uh, normally, normally indicas. I've been leaning more towards like GMO strains in general. I like that funkiness. Oh yeah. Um, bring on the funk. Yeah. Bring on the funk. <laughs> Gotta have that funk. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah that and just like you know some cushions here and there. Um, there's a local grower that I really like that has a, a strain of Kimbo Kush out that. Um, he gets some of our bugs, so um, I know he's not really messing too much around with it. So I uh, and I helped him out with kind of like his general IPM plan. So I feel pretty confident that it's getting some um, good stuff for a decent price point. Nice, yeah. nice. Now do you go do you go directly to the farm? Uh, no, I typically just try to support them through their retail sites. Gotcha. I do. I mean, I have grown medical in Washington um for about three years so not too too long um and before that i was just kind of doing basement grow stuff um i do <laughs> <laughs> i do i, well, I mean i love washington a good basement rec, grow. washington wreck they uh uh well it's my understanding that they make you do a tag in tag out even for like just at home grows oh so really i'm just not willing to actually register <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't want them knowing plants. shit. Yeah, I don't want them knowing when I'm growing. Get the fuck, stay out of yeah. my fucking house. I don't come in your house. Stay yeah. out of my house. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, that was, that's kind of that's crazy, man. Yeah, I hope they don't do that here. Here, there's a caregiver. You have to get your uh, license, like your your uh, medical card. But after that, somebody just says, "I want this person to grow my plants," and then you can grow them. You don't have to. No, they can, they can, they're allowed like on smell complaints to check your shit and stuff. Uh, but you know, it's, it's, yeah, I haven't heard of it being too much of a problem, at least recently. I mean, I should just get my, um, my medical card again. I had it when I was growing to, for the same purpose, essentially. But that's the only I reason just... why, that's the only reason why I still have mine <laughs> is to be able to home grow. Yeah. I mean, it, it, I mean. Plus, you only pay three percent tax too when you get your med card here in Illinois, which is nice. The taxes here in Illinois are outrageous if you don't have it, and the same thing in Washington too. State of Washington taxes are fucking what forty something percent. Yeah, it's Damn. it's it's absurd. Honestly, yeah, I 
I should just <laughs> yeah. dedicate my office, just clear it out. <laughs> well, who are you? Who who's Eric? How did how did who are you and what do you do? Yeah. We've had a great conversation about burgers before the show. So, but this is not about burgers, but tell us a little about yourself and then tell us about, you know, how, you know, tell us how you got into bugs. Yeah, so I've kind of always really been into bugs uh since like a really really young age. Um, one of the first memories I have uh, with bugs is trying to hold a carpenter ant on my hand, being like, look at this cool thing. It's so <laughs> awesome. And then it just bit me right on the finger. I was, yeah, like, I was, yeah. gonna, I was just about <laughs> to ask you, did it bite? <laughs> <laughs> so it was a little, you know, learn trial by fire, but you know, it was, uh, it was good. And um I've always kind of been interested in biology and I ended up uh, going to school at Seattle university, got a degree in ecological systems and biology. And then um, while I was going to school, I was managing a small food farm, about two acres. Um, and I was basement growing, <laughs> but um, I actually met the, the guy who was giving me clones at the time ended up started trimming for him while I was in college that's kind of how I got the medical growing um, kind of gig out of school. Um, and then I transferred over to ornamentals because uh, when I was growing, it was, we were doing a lot of different sprays and stuff like that, not really relying too much on the beneficials. And I really wanted to learn more about what I had been pay, like paying to learn about in school. <laughs> yeah. so, um so I moved into like growing annuals and perennials or running the integrated pest management programs for annuals and perennials. Um, and then I just met my current supervisor through the kind of greenhouse education circuit and was like, Hey man, saw you got a promotion. Is anyone covering the Pacific Northwest? And here I am teaching I am, people about bugs. That's So did you move to the Pacific Northwest from where you were before or were you already there? No, I've, I've kind of always been, so I grew up in, uh, like right outside of Portland. Okay. Um, so in Hillsboro, about, uh, 13 miles, uh, west of Portland. Okay. Um, and then, so that's like where I went to high school and then I just went, uh, straight up to, uh, Seattle, spent a few years. That's where I was doing that medical growing and then came back down for the ornamentals. And then now I'm back up. And so there you go. Just, yeah, feeling they're pretty close to one another. You don't have to travel very far. Yeah, only a couple <laughs> hours. Not, yeah, it's not bad. Not bad. Not bad. How's the How's it been in Washington this year? How's the weather? Dry. Usually it's not. I mean, July is beautiful out there. I know, but uh, dry this year. So there's yeah. some fires. Yeah, well, the fires. I mean, really, only in the last couple of weeks, it's been really pleasant. The last, like, for the most of the summer, I honestly was wondering where all the smoke was. I was like, we're well into july and the yeah. skies are clear like there must be something coming in august <laughs> and you said and it came right yep. and i cursed <laughs> us i guess <laughs> we were getting it a little bit here uh canada was getting us i'm by detroit and canada was getting us a little bit um but we usually don't deal we usually don't have any kind of any kind of fire smoke or anything here so it's been a weird it's been a weird year yeah, it has. I mean, it's been nice and clear this last couple of weeks. The fires have calmed down a little bit, but yeah, June, May, well, June, July, it was so hazy. It was like you're in a haze days. Yeah, it was pretty bad. What what kind of uh, main crops do you deal with, though? Yeah, so uh, a lot of food crops, um, mainly cannabis as well, because of all of the just honestly crazy restrictions that are put on cannabis growers for um, just just spray um, um, requirements. So there's, we, we see a lot of different chemistries that are used in organic, uh, vegetable production that are not allowed in, uh, cannabis production. Um, and that's mainly because of the lack of research and they just don't know how the plant actually metabolizes some of these chemicals. Um, but it is kind of, it definitely limits cannabis growers. So they do tend to use uh, quite a bit of bugs, but um, I have a lot of strawberry growers as well, uh, some field lettuce growers and, um, cut flowers is another big kind of market for me. So people that just like make bouquets, um, cause they want to also sell it at a higher price point. Yeah. 
I do this. I do love going to Seattle and going to that market there and looking at all the beautiful fresh cut flowers. And one of my favorite things to do is to get those dried strawberries. There's no one better. And then what is that market called again? I can't believe I'm forgetting the name of that market in Pike's Seattle. Pike's Place. That, thank you. Pike's Place. Yes. And uh, all the fresh fish and the fresh produce and the fresh cut flowers. Absolutely amazing. But those dried strawberries, boy, I wish I had some right now because <laughs> it was her fire. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Shit. Oh, man. You, uh, you, a lot of those are really similar because there are a lot of those are flower or just flowers, right? Or do you, are you finding like you, you use a ton of different, like, I know you use a ton of different bugs, but do you see a lot of similar stuff between like cannabis and other flowers and all that? Yeah. So like, especially, so I work with a lot of hops growers because hops are, hops are big in Washington, Oregon, and Idaho, which Idaho is part of my territory as well. Best hops um, in the world, baby. Come from that oh, Northwest. Yeah. Northwest. Well, they, uh, uh, they're actually related to cannabis. So yes, they, get, they are. Oh, yeah. Lagunitas. <laughs> <laughs> That's the good stuff right there. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, um, um, so what for, for weed, what is one bug? If you could say one bug, you say, listen, 10 seconds. I got one bug. This is probably the one you're going to want. What, what, what do you think? Is it different indoor and outdoor? Um, Yeah. Honestly, well, mate, I'm kind of biased as well. So I really like Aureus insidiosus, which is the minute pirate bug. Um, they're highly mobile. They also have been seen to perform well in uh, plants that produce a lot of like sulfur compounds or that are just very, um, that are very kind of, uh, have a lot of terpenes and have a lot of different resin content and stuff like that. So we see them on like lavender and not having an, a, a an aversion to mobility and stuff like that. Their favorite food is thrips, but they're technically generalists. So they'll also eat spider mites, which is huge. And they'll also go after caterpillars. Um, Their Mm. nymphs are also very aggressive. They can't fly obviously, but um, they also, they have this like kind of tie dye pattern all over their bodies. They're like kind of bright orange with a red tie dye. So I just think they look really cool, but. (laughs) Oh, Little murders. I love I, the only bug I've ever personally watched devour another bug were ladybugs, and they're savages. They face first, just you know. Oh yeah. Normal. My uh, favorite bug, and I've never put it in the tent before though, is the praying mantis style. I like watching them tear some shit yeah. up, but I, I've never put one in a tent. But just knowing they're predatory bugs and getting rid of shit, they're. Fun. I love watching them eat some eat and fight. Oh yeah. <laughs> savages too. I, uh, yeah, we'd find them in the greenhouse all the time, and I'd always just be like, "Oh yes, please, I'd like move you further in so that you yeah lay your eggs here." Yes, Live we here. Will. yes. <laughs> <laughs> you can. Uh, I I am super geeked about this episode. Uh, one because me and you haven't talked for a while. Really, we talked for a little bit uh, when I was at a larger garden, and it was all, every time we talked, I was like, "Holy shit, holy shit!" Like learning something, you know. Um, but for that reason, like my extents. Like, I don't know a ton about, I, I worked at a shop, we ordered ladybugs and nematodes. And uh, the only thing I could tell you were the ladybugs were like 75% freaking dead. Um, those little bitches weren't moving really. And I know that that's the biggest thing that I've heard with bugs is like ordering them fresh is so important. Um, yeah. Is there, is there something that, and we'll get into it. Cause I think we have, we have, you know, more meat and potatoes. Um is there a way to, as a consumer, should I be looking at my ladybugs first? Is that the only way to really be like, are these dead or alive? Or, or you know, what should I be asking my uh, my shop, my, you know, my shop guy to get the, the best uh, nematodes and ladybugs or, or any other bugs out there? Yeah. So the I'll start with the nematodes because that's a little easier to unpack. Nematodes, if they're from a reputable sp- source, will have an expiration date and they will be refrigerated. So those are the two big things that you're looking for right away. They also are very, um, they smell horrible when they're dead. <laughs> like, you know, when they're dead, like they, they, they smell like something that is dead. <laughs> um, so it's very obvious uh, uh, when they are compromised. Um, and even from the insides of the packaging, you can start to see them kind of putrefy and change color. They should be kind of like a gold, light brown color uh generally um or tannish maybe um the issue with the ladybugs and i'll try not to stand on a soapbox for too long on this one but um so 
Well, ladybugs, <laughs> they get wild harvested. Um, so there's no real way. So we sell a, a species of ladybugs that's really, really small. It's not the typical like uh, ladybirds that you guys are most likely thinking of, like the bright red with with the spots. Yep. Um, those guys are actually wild harvested in the Sierras uh, when they're hibernating. So like most things that are hibernating when they come out um, of that kind of stasis mode, they're really dehydrated. Um, so one of the main things that, uh, I would always do when I would get ladybugs was put water out for them in, and just like, uh, uh, I take like a pie tray and not quite fill the entire bottom, uh, with water, but just a little bit of droplets here and there so that they can come in and drink. Um, one of the problems though, with the ladybugs, uh, is that because they're being wild harvested, they have all of that bacteria and fungi and everything mm. that they are from, from the Sierra Cascades. So when they're going over to the Midwest, any kind of ladybugs that they interact with, it's essentially like giving them smallpox. Um, yeah. So they don't have any immune system against a lot of the, well, they might have it. There hasn't been a lot of research on it, but a lot of the times you start to see declines in native ladybug populations or your natives because they're being subjected to these outside kind of infections. Um, so normally, uh, they also can fly uh, away. <laughs> but um, <laughs> yeah. the, the, the main problem that I have with ladybugs is with all beetles, really. Um, most beetles, they actually measure, uh, they're, they're looking for an excess of a food source. So they lie, they lay eggs in proportion to how many of their babies are going to make it to adulthood. So if they only see a few aphids here or there, they're only going to lay one or two eggs. They're really waiting for those heavy infestations. That's why I always say, if you have native ladies coming in, let them do their work. Like, uh, they're amazing little predators for when you have higher pressure, for sure. Um, it's just really difficult to kind of gauge how much action they're doing again when you're in an indoor or i guess not again but when you're in an indoor setting it's a harder for them to actually escape but they're still going to gunk up those exhaust fans and stuff like that i've had that happen um frying the lights. honestly the, what sorry frying the lights i'd always get them in my yeah. hoods like stuck between the glass and the metal and shit and like yeah. i honestly would bring them in just because like in ornamentals just because they're kind of like the I call them the charismatic megafauna of biocontrol because everyone knows what a ladybug is. If someone sees you putting ladybugs out in the garden, they're like, oh, you're doing something amazing. <laughs> so it was mainly just so that I could secure my budget for the year. <laughs> it was so that I could get everyone on the farm talking about how I was doing something with these ladybugs. And then they're like, keep it up, man. <laughs> Purely selfish, but. Yeah. Hey, if it works, it works. Fucking ladybugs, dude. What um, <laughs> so, what are some of the other things to look out for when ordering bugs, though? Like when I'm ordering yeah. some bugs online. I mean, I've never done it, but I, I've seen people do it and I've heard some good stories. I said, what, what's the what are you looking for? Yeah, yeah. So normally, what you're looking for is like when you get your bugs in. Um, normally, you're looking for some form of activity. So it really it depends on the organism. Some of them are being shipped as eggs. Um, so really you're just trying to, uh, I have like a whole, uh, quality control protocol that I, I normally send to growers that essentially, like if you get something that's in an egg form, you're incubating it for a few days to make sure that it actually starts hatching out before you put it out in your crop. And that's kind of one way that you can, you can diagnose it, but you can also, um, a lot of the predatory mites and a lot of the organisms are very, very active. You can see them crawling around. Um, I always recommend to growers to get one of these like little jewelers loops so that you can go around and not just identify what's in your crop, but also identify that the bugs are alive and moving when they arrive. Because uh, uh, when you're looking for mites, you're looking for, or when you're getting predatory mites for like spider mites or something like that, you're looking for that movement in the bottle. Yeah, that makes sense. Let's get a little deeper then. Now, I'm a newbie grower. I'm going to ask you a question. So I have spider mites. What do you suggest? Yeah, yeah. So spider mites, 
Well, really all biocontrol, I feel like boils down into two kind of main components. It's either specialists or generalists. So if you have hardly any spider mites, um, where you're only seeing maybe an adult here or there, and you're trying to prevent an outbreak from happening. And Blesius californicus is, uh, it's a generalist mite. It prefers spider mites as its main food source. Uh, and it can also be foraging in temperatures of over a hundred degrees. So for cannabis production, it's going to be foraging for a majority of the time that you're growing. Yeah. Um, Persimilis, though, Phytocelius persimilis is kind of the, is the specialist for spider mites. They can only eat spider mites. Hmm. So if you have eggs, nymphs, and adults, and even webbing at some points, they can actually chew through the webbing and get into the colonies um, and start feeding on colonies there. Um, they're also a little bit smaller than spider mites, so they technically can also access the same... Um, entrances and exits that they do uh into the colony but because spider mites lay eggs in their webbing and uh, most organisms see eggs as just like a slam dunk food source they kind of get distracted and they'll they'll eat the eggs on the outsides of the webbing and stuff like that too yeah. that's dope what happens to those mites though after the spider they eat all the spider mites do they just die off yeah. Wow. So, so that's the problem with persimilis is, is they, uh, they'll actually hunt them down to starvate to the, the predator starvation. Um, and then obviously there's always going to be one or two spider mites that comes back. Um, and then that's, that's really all you need to have, uh, after a few weeks, um, they can, their populations can get ahead of you. Um, so kind of the, the, the strategy that I recommend to growers that if they're not, past the point of needing to spray is using persimilis to beat back those populations to a low level. And then even doing a Californicus release at the same time as a persimilis release so that you get those, those specialists that are really, they're hunting them down to the last, pretty much last food source for them. And then Chicken the asses. Californicus, they can feed on almost anything. Uh, well, anything that they can catch that's rel relatively around their same size. They can even feed on pollen. Um, so they're very, and obviously you guys aren't going to have a ton of pollen in indoor spaces unless you're growing for seed, which is not really. <laughs> that man right there. Really? Pollen, well, yeah, po yeah. pollen chucker of the year right there. <laughs> <laughs> All day. All I do is spray water every time I have to go into a effing flower room. I just got to spray water everywhere. He's got a mister that comes from the ceiling when he walks into his room. It works okay. Hey, man, you got to do it. That's it. Is that the same for other mites, too? And then what about, like, indoor-outdoor? Would you do the same kind of regimen? Yeah, so – um it kind of depends, honestly, in outdoor settings, you have so much more kind of dynamic flow of different organisms. Um, I always recommend to growers to kind of plant um, extra non-target uh, or non-production crops is what I call them, um, or banker plants is the common term for them. Um, and a lot of that is just to try to promote the natives to come in and deal with, with what you're doing. But we do have um, like for caterpillars, like you were saying, we have like a specific uh, parasitic wasp that actually targets their eggs. So depending on the species of, so a lot of what my job is, is you send me a photo of a caterpillar or a moth, I help you identify it. And then we figure out which one of the three kind of parasites works on it. And then we kind of go through for each of the pests that, um, that each grower is typically historically dealing with. Um, because I mean, and I'm sure you guys know this, your pest pressure is going to be different if you have a field of grass versus a field of corn um, right next to you, you know? Yeah. Hmm. What about for uh, aphids? Yeah. Yeah. So aphids are an interesting one. Um, we have, a, a, it's called a green lacewing. It's pretty similar to a, uh, ladybug honestly the, the larva looks very similar to a ladybug larvae they kill it in veg especially when you have 
uh, uh, like all we call them green bridges. So your your canopy is all touching, um, and you haven't really spaced it out. And they have all these different touch points to go across. Um, they're great at roaming around and looking for for. I mean, they can eat aphids, thrip, spider mite. Um, their aphids are their preferred food source. So they those guys are gen, the generalists. But what's really neat about the cannabis aphid is that all three of the parasitic wasps that we produce will host in the cannabis aphid. Um, so these guys are literally like the xenomorphs from the alien franchise. They hmm. roll up and they probe the aphid to make sure that it's healthy. And then they rear back and sting them. Oh man. <laughs> That's fucking and the aphid's dope. only defense is to just shake around and dodge. <clears throat> They ain't getting away. Yeah. They ain't getting away. I, I seen I I seen an a, I know what an aphid looks like. They're not that quick. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> I've watched plenty of animal shows in my life and insect shows and all that kind of stuff. So I've seen it. They ain't that fast. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. And those guys like what what's really cool about them is is each so we have three species, each one of them can host in about 30 different species of aphids. So like for outdoor grows when you have low pressure and you could have some aphids that are up in your oaks, or you could have some aphids that are over on like a grass species or something that might not even be targeting your cannabis, but those guys can still host in that they get all of their eggs laid and they're still in the general area, continuing that cycle of laying eggs because they like aphids are predominantly coming out as females. So they don't, they reproduce asexually. So they don't actually, they do produce males for genetic diversity, but for the most part, it's all the ladies doing the work. Damn. Hey, ladies. <laughs> now, I had fungus gnats once, and uh, they were a fucking pain in the ass to get rid of. And I, and, I, and I tried to do it with the yellow cards and shit. That worked, but it didn't get rid of them. Yeah. Yeah. So that actually brings up a great point. That is – so monitoring – is amazing for my job like if you have a sticky card that you could send me a photo of oh my gosh that's like <laughs> i can actually like try to discern what's happening there as opposed to a random photo of a leaf or something like that it's a little bit harder um mainly because of that bright yellow it really makes a lot of the features pop um but with fungus gnats there's actually so that the nematodes will work well um, but there's also a uh, bacillus thuringiensis israelensis. Uh, it's called BTI. Uh, a lot of times you'll see it as like mosquito dunks or something like that. Um, but you're looking for, there's a lot of bacillus thuringiensis. You're looking for specifically the subspecies israelensis, literally spelled Israel and then uh, E or is it? yeah, E N S I S. Um, that is, will only really target fungus gnat larvae. Uh, it's like gnat larvae is, is what that specific thing goes after. And its shelf life is astronomically better than nematodes. So you mm -hmm. can just buy a container of it and just apply as you need it as a knockdown. Into the soil, fish. right? Because they, they, yep. they ate the uh, larvae. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, so the, the fungus gnats, they're primarily looking for feeding on the actual, their larvae are feeding on the roots. Uh, root systems of the plants um yeah, exactly and um we do have some predators that roam around in the soil um for the the, the best one that i think for cannabis is going to be we have two but the best one i think is going to be stradiolalab schematis which is a isn't tight <laughs> 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 its favorite its favorite food is fungus gnat larvae they've done a few different studies um and it doesn't fly the other soil predator delosia uh delosia coriaria it does fly which if their populations get too high or if you use just too high of a dose and they're looking for food then fly up get caught in the buds and then you got more work on your hands so Definitely look for the mite. The soil mites are where it's at. Okay. For fungus gnats. All right. All right. I like this. Big yeah. girl. Thanks, yeah. man. Like I said, I had caterpillars outside. 
and then I had fungus gnats. I got rid of them. It took it was a fucking took some time though to get rid of those little bastards. Um, but never had aphids or spider mites. Never gonna say I'm not gonna have them. But this is all gonna help me out. I love it. Big girl, what you got for man? Did you have a suggestion on caterpillars? Oh yeah. So the um those little wasps for the eggs, um they're called trichogramma. Um, and for the for the most part, so we produce three species. For the most part, Trichogramma brassicae. So, like, uh, brassica is the easiest like word that looks like it, which is just like broccoli and cabbage and stuff like that. Um, they really like kind of field crops, but there's also uh, a few other species that will kind of they they forage at different levels, um, and so. A lot of the other species are used in kind of orchards for caterpillars in orchards where it's 15 feet up in the sky. Um, so typically you're going to be looking at trichogramma um, brassicae specifically as the species, but also kind of dependent on the pest as well, because they can only host in a specific in like a 10, 20 different species of caterpillar eggs. Yeah. So yeah. Identification is key, but the nice thing is, is that we sell uh, a product that has all three of the species, um, and that treats about, I want to say, a little over 10,000 square feet, and it's like 15, 20 bucks or something like that. Hell yeah. So for the most part, pretty economical, and you kind of just cover all your bases because you got all three of them out there. Hmm. Um, yeah. You wouldn't so, do that. Would you Would you use those in an indoor grow, though? Well, you ain't getting caterpillars in indoor. I mean, that's like one in a million chance. Unless you get a moth yeah, unless in you're... Your, get a couple of moths in your house or some shit like that. But that'd be the only way. So that's more for outdoor. But how do you get them to stay on the out? Like, how are you going to Will they stay because their food source is there and not fly they, away? Exactly. They oh, require, cool. in order for them to reproduce, similar to those aphid parasites or parasitoids, technically, um, they need that host body so like they don't actually produce a pupil casing they require the caterpillar egg to actually complete their life cycle okay Um, super nerdy i love it yeah yeah they use use their own body i love it i'm a a nerd so i I love i'm I'm nerded out i'm nerding out on this right now so i'm an anime nerd but i'm nerding out on bugs i love it yeah (laughs) what are we missing what i know we didn't talk about like root aphids or like russet mice which are like the two biggest pains in in the ass to me yeah Uh, what, what are we missing here Yeah, I mean, those are really the other two big ones, I'd say. I mean, uh, a lot of growers, I feel like, get hung up on thrips right now. Um, And that's mainly because when thrips feed on the plant, they can actually, well, so in ornamentals, what I had a big uh, problem with was thrips really like pollen when I was was growing flowers. So that was an issue. Um, But they also vector disease really easily. They can vector a number of different diseases. Now, we haven't confirmed that these thrips can vector like HLV or anything like that. Um, but growers are still hesitant. They don't want them. They don't want the thrip. Like, I think what it is, is the, the perception is, is that if, if thrips can do this for multiple different viruses or viroids, don't let them start to figure this one out too in cannabis. Yeah. <laughs> um but honestly, the damage is not insane. Like, it, it's pretty easy to manage uh, uh, thrips in cannabis. I mean, maybe not easy, but um, it's, I mean, there are definitely some tools for them as opposed to things like root aphids. Our soil predators will not eat root aphids. Um, nematodes will not. I, I know that there's a lot of information on the internet and feel free to dispute this because, I mean, None of it is peer reviewed. <laughs> well, the uh, the stuff on the internet is not peer reviewed for that says that nematodes will enter um, root aphids. I mean, technically they can, but they won't kill them. Um, soil predators will not eat them in a populate or in a number that will actually control them. Um, so while there is some of this like kind of anecdotal, like, well, they did eat it. And it's like, well, they're not able to control it or even really prevent it or even kind of halt it from progressing. Um, So for root aphids, a lot of it comes down to drenches. 
uh, timing your drenches. And unfortunately, those drenches are expensive because of kind of what we were talking about earlier. Um, just not a lot of research is done on other products. So a lot of things like Bavaria Bassiana, Isera, Isaria Fumosorosia, um, those are two species of, or two kind of common um, drenches that you can make that will target the root aphids. Um, they're, they're mostly going to be uh, kind of sporulating on the, uh, the aphids body and then punching a hole right into it and drinking it for food pretty much. Yeah. Um, one thing I always like to say, if you can get away with it, always phyto trial everything and do it for two weeks. So if you apply a product that you've never applied to your plants before, wait two weeks before you, I mean, and you can go through your normal regimen, um, but just know that something in that normal regimen might be interacting with the application that you made. Yeah. So you just need to be very diligent about your note taking uh, whenever you're trying to incorporate a new chemistry, even if it is all above board and approved for use in cannabis. I still say that there's so much just genetic diversity in there that you don't know. Like you, you kind of want to get your ducks in, in order before, yeah. before you really kind of implement it on a large scale for your whole production. Yeah. I, Sweet. that Bavaria Bassiana was the only thing I found that helped me at all with uh, root aphids. Uh, but you mentioned to drench it. How do you like to apply it? Yeah. A good, very, very good question. Root aphids are very shitty diggers. They do not go into the root ball. Very, I mean, like you can tear apart root balls and you're not really going to find much of anything of them in there. They all kind of hang out on the sides of that pot. Um, or in the case of like living soil beds on the sides of the actual bed themselves. So you can kind of target those areas, but, uh, honestly, like overhead, we call it overhead watering, not obviously hitting your plants with water, but, um, using kind of like a spigot or something like that, not necessarily drip irrigation because a drip emitter is normally not going to be hitting the fringes of the pots as easily as you could with kind of like a, um, I just use a sump pump attached to a garden hose. Um, and then have like a 30 gallon mix take that I was feeding out of. Um, but that, that's where I think would be the easiest kind of applicate is, is direct trying to target it around the general pot, um, so that you can actually hit them with the media and honestly rock will, that's where it gets really difficult because it takes a lot of labor to treat for root aphids in yeah. rock wool. They're everywhere. And then you miss fucking one of them. <clears throat> Yeah, and, you know, like it, there's root, root aphids and uh, russet mites. The worst part with russet mites is not identifying them fast enough. If you can get to them fast enough, for me it was. Like by the exactly. time I was like, "Holy shit, this is something different." They were just, it was like, there's nothing you can. The do. problem with russet mites is, is that when you see damage, it's pretty much at the point where you need to intervene chemically, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, sulfur and oil, obviously not together. Or within two weeks of each other, because you'll cause burn. <laughs> but um, those are your best friends against russet mites, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, obviously, sulfur is very limiting while you're in flower. Um, my general protocol was whether I saw anything or not, they were getting a sulfur burn going into going into the flower rooms, regardless. Yeah. I saw a lot of that sulfur burn stuff fall off more recently. Like a lot of that, that company that was, uh, man, what was that company that was dominantly making those like hangers? Then they had like a lawsuit or something where they were catching on fire or some shit. Not uh, surprising. You know oh yeah. It was, it was like, and that, but sulfur burning worked really well for, uh, for not only bugs for people, um, but PM. Yeah. It helps really well with the PM in there. Um, but it's just hard to find those units now to do sulfur burns from what I'm told. Yeah. You can get elemental sulfur as well. Like just, um, I think it's either Bayer or like BSF or whatever from like home Depot, you can get elemental sulfur. That's like a sprayable essentially. Oh yeah, sure. But yeah, I mean, I definitely liked the, I like the burn aspect of it. Cause I had four room, four large rooms. So I was like, okay, well I'm done with this. Lights yeah. are going off. 
Set the sulfur off. Let's go to a different room. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so what what do you 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 we had talked about right before the show? I think it was right before the show, using spray with uh predatory bugs. Is there some kind of like regimen or product or anything that you like over another? Yeah, so honestly, a lot of uh I always say like with the, with the 25 B exempt chemicals, there is some benefit, but there is also like really look at the label. Um, because I personally believe that when you're looking oil is oil and a lot of those 25 B exempts are just a combination of different oils, which do have, I mean, some of like rosemary oil, they do have some repellency factors to them for sure. Um, but in terms of suffocation properties, Normally what you're shooting for is about a 1% concentration. A lot of those chemicals are not the 25 B exempt chemistries are going to be clocking in around 0.5% in mixed concentration. Um, Which, so, so I mean, like there are definitely some benefits to it. I mean, I use green cleaner for powdery mildew back in the day. I mean, I'm not, not, I don't knock 25 B exempt chemicals. They definitely, I mean, you can reintroduce bugs next day. Yeah. After using them. Yeah. You can walk in there like an hour after you spray. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, exactly. You could do it the same day. Probably as long as it's dry, it's not going to mess with the beneficials for the most part. Like, um, but one really cool tool I like is, uh, um, so the, the bio best side effects manual. So if you just Google, BioBest side effects manual, it'll actually come up with a bunch of different chemistries and uh, beneficial organisms as well. And it'll tell you the general percentage of how many of your, like it'll, you'll kill 75% of your population if you make this type of application. Um, And it'll tell you the residual on it as well. So it might be two days, three days, five days, seven days, two weeks. Um, a lot of the chemistries you guys have are not going to be those two week chemistries. Yeah. <laughs> those are like systemics <laughs> yeah. are not allowed in, can- in cannabis or shouldn't be used in cannabis. I should say. Yeah. Well, a lot of the, what I found at least in my, cause I was only in shop. I'm going to know where I, when I get a lot of this experience or what I've learned of it. But a lot of that is that uh, people don't quite understand what a half life is a lot. And so when they spray, <laughs> They're like, well, you know, it's got a 90 day half life. So like, I think, or a 45 day half life or whatever that some of those are. And it's like, so in 45 days, I'm good. And it's like, well, maybe in like a few hundred days, you're good. But I don't know if you have any of that research even. Explain, explain, explain yourself, big girl. What's a half life for all of us newbies? It's, It's when like half of that product is gone. But it okay. doesn't, it does, it's not like 50% and 50%. It's just half of the, I don't know if you would say the effectiveness or of the compound itself. I'm not smart enough to know any of that. But if it's a 45-day half-life and 45 days, it's at 50%. 50% of that product is, is in that plant. Then in 90 days, it's 25%. And then 135 days, it's 12.5%. And then at 100 and, wow, what is that, like fucking 70 days or 80 days, whatever that is, it's at 6.2, 6.25% or whatever. I don't, I don't know what number I'm at now, but it doesn't go. It's, it's not just out of your plant. It's not just out of your plant, like two times after the half-life or whatever you want to, you know, it was just, it's just a problem. No, yeah. You're, yeah, you no, go. that's a great explanation. Um, so yeah, and it, it, it's true. Yeah. It, it, and we don't know. And a lot of that too, some of that is about combustion more than anything, where it's like, if you're making edibles, we're not, at least from what I see, we're not really sure what it's doing or if it's doing anything really bad. But when you combust it, it's making like a poisonous gas or some shit. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and so well, good. A good example of this is with, I was, I was alluding to it earlier. Um, spinosad, not allowed in cannabis, yeah. but it is allowed in organic vegetable production. Um, and the reason for that is because they understand how it metabolizes and that half-life in the plant. Um, they don't, they set it up originally when they were doing trials or from what I've heard is that they haven't been able to test out of it essentially like with cannabis. So 
uh, an application that's made in veg, the half-life is significantly longer than it is in organic vegetables. And they don't quite know why it metabolizes slower, um, but they're still finding those metabolites at the end of the flowering cycle, which is no, no good. Yeah, yeah. Mm. That's, all, that's, all, yeah. That's, that's the whole point. Uh, that's the best part of legality is the testing that's coming with it and like the actually being able to be like, okay, we think this, but can we please prove it real quick? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> We had talked about some beneficials a little earlier. What um, kind of what is there a flower, a type of flower that you like to use outside to attract these bugs or, or to make bugs want to stay there? So after your infestation is gone, you maybe don't have to buy new bugs more than once a year, um, maybe more than once or twice every now and again, because if they can survive in your atmosphere, you know. Um, but is there a type of flower or anything you like? Uh, yeah. That? So so flowering herbs in general is, are really that are really good for beneficial so things like fennel um they they were in dill they really like those things with like a lot of bright yellow flowers all over the place right. that are like hey look at me that's what uh and it's it's kind of draw adding that draw in factor um same thing is is going on with the sticky cards those insects are just picking up um on that yellow being a flower that's what they think it is and then they just get stuck um another good one is sweet alyssum um because it's very hardy but the issue with that is that the petals get everywhere so unless you have some kind of an exclusion zone like some kind of fence or something between like outdoor cannabis um i don't say plant sweet alyssum like in between is that a new song by the almond brothers i've never heard of (laughs) yeah a new a new song by the almond (laughs) (laughs) sweet alyssum sweet alyssum it is it is cool how i don't have a ton of experience outside (laughs) but you do definitely like it it is cool how you see because the my experience outside is on uh it's like a historic horse farm basically tons of flowers everywhere they don't you know they're not weeding fences or anything and uh it was so much easier for me to control like any kind of pests out there compared to anything indoor i was very uh uh excited and and uh uh what is the word maybe not surprised as much but just uh it was just excited It it was cool it was fun to to do that for sure outside um, so is there any other ways other than flowers? Like can people put like yellow tarps down or anything Would that like draw in beneficials or, or something like that? Yeah. So, um, that's a good question. Actually, I haven't thought about that. Um, normally what I say is to just kind of plant like, uh, normally I say to get like kind of the biggest pots that you can find that are cheap. I don't want to break the bank on this cause it's non-production plants. Um, but kind of stationing them every like two, 300 feet. So like looking for like large stands of trees or uh, large areas of diversity, planting one planter right on the edge of that. So you're grabbing whatever's there. And then a few hundred feet after that, putting another one. So you're kind of creating islands for the organisms to move their move through to your crop. Um, it's like put the other down. down. That's how you'd catch me. <laughs> the Reese's down and another Reese's like 10 feet in front of that and like I know, sudden, I, 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 know how to, I know how to I know how to lead you to the house now big girl when yeah. I want some weed just fucking yeah. Reese pieces all the way like fucking sense. like fucking E.T. and shit yeah. <laughs> I mean it makes a ton of sense because it's like you know especially if you're not by like woods or, or something like how are you gonna even get some of those bugs out there yeah yeah, no, and the the other thing too is we have a so for predatory mites is like a supplemental food. I said that they can eat pollen, so for indoor um, indoor plants, it's not a good idea to just throw pollen around willy nilly because thrips can eat it. Um, but the parent company of so I work for Beneficial Insectary, uh, the parent company of Beneficial Insectary BioBest, they actually have a patent a patent on a specific species of cattail pollen that thrips can't eat, but predatory mites can. Um, So that's one way that you can kind of get more bang for your buck as well. But we also sell um, sterilized moth eggs 
for the generalists. So like things like Aureus and Lacewing, um, it adds an extra protein component to it, which is very enticing for them. That's, that's pretty much what they're looking for is, is protein uh, and carbohydrates. Kind of, kind of like what we need too, right? Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> they're just carnivores. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I, I'm in a small basement. I grow. I got a small little tent. What's a like a preventative IPM? Do you recommend for somebody like myself or other home growers that grow in a small little basement tent? Yeah. So a lot of the, a lot of the units that we sell um, are going to be. I would dare to say five, 10 times over the high rate um, of, of a recommended rate in cannabis. So that being said, anytime you introduce like an Aureus or something like that, um, it's going to be a lot more effective because there's, they're just higher concentration. Um, it's difficult with companies like myself for home growers because the smallest, so like we have predatory mites that are in these little breeder communities called sachets that you just hang on the plant. But the smallest unit is a hundred, which again oh, is going to be like way more than you need. Um, so there are a few resources out there. Um, there are a few of our distributors that actually uh, will sell individual sachets and they will sell individual lace wing cards and stuff like that. So you can get it. It, it is a little bit more tailored to the home grower. Um, so if you reach out to us, then, uh, so our, our website is Insectary, so just insectary.com. If you have any kind of questions or anything like that, you can submit like a questionnaire. It'll go to our customer service. And then uh, one of the IPM specialists like myself will also assess it and be like, okay, well. Hi, this, this is Eric. Can I help yeah. you? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but also like, hey, I might hey, not Mr. be able Mr. to Mr. Weedman and Big Earl sent us. What do you got for us? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We want, everybody on the, that listens to the show now, they're going to request you. Just know that. So if you got like 10 people working at the center, we want to talk to Eric. Remember that, everybody. Eric. That's who you want to talk to. Nobody else. There's nobody else in that box but Eric. <laughs> hey, man. That's a great promotion for me. There you go. <laughs> But yeah, like we, uh, I might, I mean, I, I'm pretty candid with growers. I'll say, look, man, like I can't, I might not be able to take you on as a commercial customer, but I know a distributor that's going to be able to give you a good price point. That's going to be able to get you some bugs really easily. Um, that are going to be, um, that kind of higher quality, uh, in terms of vigor and vitality. Um, so kind of one of the things we didn't talk about is that, uh, Beneficial Insectary is actually the largest domestic insectary. Um, so we produce uh, about 80% of the organisms in-house right in Reading. Um, and what that means is, is that we can pretty much just package up those bugs. So you place an order, we give you a ship date uh, when, it, when the culture is available, essentially. That, uh, that bottle or whatever you're getting gets pulled out of production and is put in a box same day a lot of the time maybe 24 hours in the case of sachets because we have to kind of pre-make those um but so they're not really spent and then we overnight the bugs so they're not spending any more than 48 hours in transit for a lot of the time which is in terms of viability you're normally i i say take the reese's or the hershey's challenge or the coke challenge or whatever put us up against any other producer just because we're, we're just domestic. So we're able to have that higher quality. They're not in, they're not being shipped on a plane. Um, they're, they're just going pretty much from Sacramento out to you. Um, on a shelf or in a warehouse or on three different trucks. Um, exactly. That's what a lot of the bugs that we would deal with were. And that's, it was like, you know, maybe these things might be a month old. You don't know. Really, yeah. You know, so yeah yeah that's yeah that's badass um can you split so like if i have four or five gromies in the area those i was, I was thinking the same thing I'll earl same thing up, or is it kind of like if you let them go you gotta kind of let them go so no what you can do is i i call them co-ops um the only issue with it is is that as long as i mean it works when you're when you're close-knit with some some growers that are nearby because yeah. the bugs come in on whatever Wednesday, they need to go out on the plants 
Wednesday, no later than Thursday. So, so exactly. So if it's just your neighbors or someone who's like 30, 45 minutes away and can come grab it, they know, like you just forward them the, uh, cause we, we, sh- we give you uh shipping tracking information as well. So you just forward over that tracking information to all your grower friends that have their package coming and then, um, kind of meet up like that. Um, but I definitely have, that's where I, I mean, I've taken on some customers like that, that I've been able to give them commercial pricing because nice. it's kind of more of a conglomerate, which is, which would be if, if we piece them all together, it would be the same as like a small medical grow or something like that, or a small yeah. rec grow, um, which is totally, I'm, I'm totally fine with that. Yeah. Nice. That's, um, nice. that's, you know, that's an awesome option. I think, uh, more and more we're going organic and trying to be a little bit more natural. And so, and we don't, yeah. when you're a smaller gardener, you don't get a lot of that uh, break these days. <laughs> yeah. And we also, I mean, so technically we're not supposed to sell, um, direct past. I'm trying to remember the territory line, but we do have a lot of distributors that essentially are drop shipping, um, from us. Um, so essentially it depends on the state. So that's kind of why it has to be screened through the websites that we can make sure that you're actually going to the appropriate, uh, person because our parent company has been kind of the ones who have dictated that kind of territory line. Um, but it's pretty much East of the Rockies. We're not technically allowed to go, uh, direct with customers is the way I said, like as a direct uh, commercial customer. But um, one of my very close friends, actually, uh, he used to work for us directly. Um, He has an outfit out there, but then there's also a number of different companies that also produce uh, chemistries that you might need, um, or like Bavaria Bassiana and stuff like that. So you can actually get a lot of the, um, and they honestly offer a lot better, like, uh, like terms and stuff like that, that uh, we don't offer. Uh, we're just straight up like credit card. You got to pay for it up front. Um, so these guys are a little bit more flexible with things like that. So we can definitely, um, but that that's all part of my job is trying to figure out what's the easiest way for you to get some bugs in your garden and that it's going to be an appropriate amount to take care of whatever's happening. Yeah. Fuck yeah, dude. That's badass. Yeah. I, I, I can say when I, when we, me and you first talked, it was, I wish that the people I was working with would have taken that path because I was, so the the reason that we had even talked is because they were constantly pulling in fresh air and we had talked about the flowers and stuff too, and just about everything. And it was super uh, informative. uh, And it was very obvious. You were just trying to help me. And uh, it was, it was, it was very cool. So I appreciate you, man. I have one, I have one more question and this is, I'm very excited about this question. We saved it for last. And I hope that, I don't know, uh, it's not about live bugs per se, but I use a diatomaceous earth spray. I fucking swear by this stuff. I, when I was fighting russet mites for like the, I, you know, they came back like three times in a row because I wasn't proper. I think I was getting them from my yard more than anything. So on my dogs or something. And uh, yeah. so they just, I, I, anyway, long, I'm not going to go into that. But I got, I have a, a friend of mine who, um, it's just a badass gardener. And I'm like, bro, I am, these things are fucking me up. I have no other option. I'm not <laughs> shit online. And he gave me this recipe for a diet, diatomaceous earth spray. You put the powder in the water and as long as you're agitating it pretty frequently, it's pretty um, easy to spray. Like even like a little hand pump bottle kind of thing. Yeah. Have you ever used anything like that? Am I crazy? Cause no, I, I don't see anybody ever using that, but it, I feel like it works so well for me. I used I, I use it too, but I haven't made the slurry yet, and I'm so interested in hearing this because I want to start using that for my outdoor, especially. So, diatomaceous earth D, because I don't want to say it all the time. So D E, yeah, yeah, <laughs> it uh, it's essentially a bunch of just little small glass particles. Is the easiest way to understand it, right? They're little pieces of silica, not technically glass. Um, and so what that does is when it's wet it doesn't really do too much at all yeah. but when it's dry. So like when you're spraying it onto the plants and it's sitting on that leaf surface, when it dries, it just is cutting up the insects as they pass over it. Um, so in terms of like indiscriminate 
we're just gonna kill some stuff real quick from mechanic <laughs> from mechanical <laughs> like, yeah the, i mean they, the insects they don't have a defense against it there's no risk of uh uh resistance it's not like they're gonna grow tougher skin in a year you know that that takes hundreds of years um so for the most part i mean i think it's a great tool for sure and that, i mean when we talk about ipm it's all about tools in the tool belt right bugs are one the sprays are one de is one um so really just trying to understand it i think that a lot of growers will utilize uh diatomaceous earth in veg um to just try to get those numbers down initially um i honestly haven't used it in flower so i'm not 100 percent certain how that would go i did Uh, you have oh i did i did i did the powder though so i didn't do the slurry so but i did do powder yeah no outside we had it I had an outdoor and I just took a cup and just dribbled the cup all over it. And yeah, just like kind of like shook it all over there. And I had to, because it was like, there was, it was like, right. There was some, it was going to get ugly. So we just threw a bunch and it it saved it. It was, we knew it. I knew it. I just knew it. It was that time of the year. And I'm like, they're coming. (laughs) We got to just start adding it to it, to throw it on the soil, throw, sprinkle it all around, you know, and it'll take care of its business. And then it rained and it washes it off. But that was my question so since it rained earl would it make the slurry the because it's still the rain is falling on it and does it just wash it all away does it does it does it dry re-dry on there so here's what i do so i throw a little soap in with it and i hit it in veg but i have to spray what i do is in flour i don't like to do it super late maybe like six seven i'll go through just a water spray and i try to hit it down but before that, I can see it on my stalks. I can, especially everything lower, you know, everything new, I don't see it on. But it just, it makes me almost like feel good. Like where I'm like, if a bug's trying to crawl up this, it's getting fucked up. Um, but, and that's what I, and I asked the guy who gave me the, the you know, recipe for it, which is not, it's, it's just 50 grams per gallon. Um, not like, like a big, uh, crazy recipe. He said that it won't, because well, I asked about the efficacy in the flour. I was like, so what about flour? Like, you know, you don't anything about that. And he had said that, you know, he doesn't know about the ethics so much, efficacy, but he, it won't fail tests. So, I smoked the, I smoked the, I smoked it. Or I told I actually smoking it right that? now. And, and, uh, I don't taste anything different. It just doesn't have that pungent smell for outdoor. It smells a lot more grassy, but like I said, it's still curing. It's only in its first week of cure, but I mean, I smoke nice. I'm high as fuck. So <laughs> I don't, and I mean, like I said, you it, it, DE is harmful to you as a human. You could actually eat it. It's not going to hurt you if you ate it. Uh, and dogs, animals too. So I mean, yeah. and it's not going to hurt. I on my dogs before we go on walks and stuff because I don't like to give them that prevent the pills. So when we go on like walks in the woods, I sp- I spray them with that exact same solution. That's smart. I was going to say that I actually got me and my gal over the hump with uh, fleas on the dog was nothing was working and then we just put de out a couple times and did you do this sl- did you make the slurry or you just took the <laughs> no, white stuff just and just dry. rubbed it all well, that's fine you just rubbed it all in it's not gonna hurt them that's actually a great fucking idea man i didn't even think about that fuck gentlemen all right i like that a lot because uh we go a lot of hikes and shit too and i'm always worried man i, I give her the pill the heartworm pill the three in one but it's a really good idea for double protection though especially when you're going out and you know because it keeps it'll keep the ticks away and it'll keep the fleas away yeah yeah Great idea, gentlemen. Guys, a the fucking... other thing that I was going to say that's great about putting it on the stock that I haven't even thought about until just now is the fact that onion thrips and western flower thrips, they'll actually drop down off of the plants um, to finish their... So they'll drop down to go into their last nymphal life stage uh, before they come out as adults, and then they crawl back onto the plants as adults. So you're yeah, making applications around the base. Yeah, and... that's... It's just, you know, I don't know. I'm glad that it's, it makes sense because, like, I, I was like, it seemed to work really well. But then I, I just I, – and I, I trust, you know, my buddy is super smart. He's got – he does a lot of different – he has a lot of gardens. Um, uh, but you, when you don't see it anywhere else, I was like, how I don't see anybody spraying this. And I had people tell me, oh, once it gets wet, it doesn't work. I said, well, it dries out eventually, right? And they're like, yeah, but it still, you know, it just still doesn't work. I was like, okay, well, I can't find anything to say you're wrong or right. Um, but well, especially with a drought tolerant plant like cannabis, when you're incorporating it into the soil, it's like, yeah, you're going to have wet soil for 
a portion of the time. But like, I mean, if you can allow that dry down, especially in veg to occur, then you're just going to be ripping those fungus gnats apart. You're yeah. talking about putting D on the soil, right? That's what I do. I do. I I have done that before. So when I had the fungus gnat problem, I used just D and I put it on there. And then when you wet it, it gets like concrete for a second there. But then you just take a little fucking steak and it yeah. just breaks right back up. I, I mean, I've done it. It works. <laughs> It works. It got those yeah. fuckers good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's an un- unused tool. I, uh, you know, I don't know about unused, but untalked about. No, it's underrated, though, for so sure. So underrated. Yeah, it's all natural. It ain't going to do nothing. So, gentlemen, fucking great show. Uh, Big Girl, you got anything else to ask Ask Eric before we uh, let him go? I mean, no, dude. That was all. I love the show. Um, I'm excited to talk with you again. Um, I appreciate you. Uh, it was fucking awesome. Yeah, yeah man. man, it was a lot of fun. It was my first kind of podcast venture. So I've done like public speaking before, but I've never done like podcast. recording. Nice. <laughs> Hell yeah. I love it. We're your first. We 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 did podcast you. I love it. So you're ready yeah. to go now on. So give us give us uh, uh some plugs. Where you work, who you work for, where we can find you at on Insta yeah. or any of your social media, where people can reach out and talk to you. Yeah. Right, go to that again. Let me see. Oh ben- Benef- oh, beneficial insectary gotcha yep. Yep. beneficial insectary down in redding california um we have a pretty active instagram tiktok uh facebook as well if you're into that um not so much twitter or x or whatever um <laughs> <laughs> is that a real i, I, I don't even know it's a real thing it's like, what the it's fuck real <laughs> but it's yeah real. just just look us up, Beneficial Insectary on social media, insectary.com. Um, and then, yeah, there, there's also a lot of great resources in terms of, like, what the bugs are actually doing, what they're eating on the website as well. So you can view it based off of pest and kind of, like, what actually eats them. Yeah, cool. Nice. Lots I of love it. Well, we... We'll have to uh, look you up again, and uh, we appreciate you. Like I said, people that listen to this show are probably going to call – beneficial in sector and just say we just want to talk to eric that's so, fine eric they'll, remember literally that. what they'll do is be like hey someone called and they're like hey i want to talk to eric and i'll be like okay put him through <laughs> mention the show everybody and be all good the girl hour be all good <laughs> well we appreciate we appreciate you man and uh big girl's got one last question to ask you before we sign off we got to find out if, if, if you use this or not were you i didn't know that was the question before I do know that, and you can probably second this, we could forget almost about everything. If we just add extra cow mag <laughs> to our plants, uh, pretty much pest resistant uh, in my experience most of the time. Just triple or quadruple sometimes. Well, sometimes they suggest. Don't forget the cow mag, everybody. Yeah. Peace! <laughs> Check out our cannabis lifestyle brand online at 8decades.com. Our custom smokes and accessories are perfect for your coffee table, bedroom nightstand, or kitchen counter. They're designed for you to show them off. The Canna community is also loving our hemp and cotton blend t-shirts, sweatshirts, scarves, and hats, finished off with our 8 Decades logo. We've got some awesome long-lasting goods that will be your favorite for years to come. 8 Decades, because a ninth decade of cannabis prohibition isn't acceptable.